Amen. All right, guys, let's just start right into this book. Uh, as I said and mentioned before, James, he didn't believe in the beginning that Jesus was who he said he was. He didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah, but it wasn't until after, until the crucifixion, then the resurrection, that James truly believed. And then James, he became a huge pillar in the Jerusalem church. He was a huge part in spreading this gospel message early on, and his influence was so profound that he was referred to as James the Just. He was even referred to as a bishop. He was the overseer of this Jerusalem church. He carried a great authority and respect and wisdom. And we're going to see that here when we jump into these words. You might not understand these verses right away. I know for me, uh, it, this is James, the book of James has been so impactful, but it is very hard sayings, but they are truly wise and they're truly powerful. So James, he is no slouch. He knows what he's talking about and he is saying these things to help us. So some of the things that we're going to discover while we are in this book, he's going to be showing us how we can put our faith into action by showing love, mercy, and compassion. This is also where we get the verse that faith without works is dead. Very powerful verse, which means that we can't just, you know, slouch around. That would show that we don't truly believe in this gospel. But it's by actions. It's by us going out there and living this thing out that we show that we truly believe. He's going to show us that we should be producing fruit and good works with our lives. So I'm, I'm so excited to get into all that, but let's just start in verse 1 and with the introduction, and we'll get right into it. So verse 1, it says, This letter is from James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's very interesting. Right off the bat, James, he's calling himself a slave of Christ. And this is the first time we hear this word slave. Even Paul, the apostle, he called himself a slave to Christ. Slave basically just means a servant, which means somebody who is forsaking everything that they know to serve one master. And certain people might get offended by that. And I understand. I understand the word slave isn't a popular term. But it truly just shows how in love with Jesus these men of God truly were. They understood that their sin put Jesus Christ on that cross. And they were going to do anything and everything the Lord commanded. No matter how much pleasure and comfort they were willing to sacrifice, they knew that it was for a greater purpose. And it was to the one who gave his life for theirs. So they lowered themselves just as Christ. He lowered himself. As scripture says, he became a servant. When he was God, he had the ultimate authority. He should have been glor glorified and worshipped at any any moment that he was around any person, right? Scripture tells us that the rocks would even cry out. If nobody sung the praises of God, the rocks would cry out in praise to Jesus. So James, he is taking the example of Jesus. And similar to Paul, he is claiming to be a slave of God, which means he has one purpose, and that is to live for God's will above his own. He says, I am writing to the 12 tribes, the Jewish believers scattered abroad. Greetings. Verse 2, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect, complete, lacking nothing. Now that's a bombshell, at least to me personally. James, he's telling me, to have joy, to have happiness, and to have this feeling even when I am going through the difficult moments of my life? How? How is that possible? How are we to have joy when there is nothing to be joyful about? That's just unnatural. That's just something that doesn't just happen. That is something that is done willfully. That is something done through choice. And what's funny is that we saw this with the Apostle Paul. If you if you read those chapters uh, where Paul, he's in prison, and he's telling the churches to be joyful, always to be joyful, and that he considers it, the Apostle Paul, this is what he says, that he has learned how to be joyful with abundance and how to be joyful with nothing. And you have to understand the Apostle Paul, he's always in prison. He's always there with chains and he's writing these messages. 
He's going through so much pain and suffering and isolation, but yet he is telling others that he has found a way to be joyful in any circumstance. And just like Paul, James, he is expressing that same power. And the only way that we can have joy, guys, when we're going through the hardest moments in our lives is when we actually put our faith in this word, that we actually put our faith in what Jesus tells us. Jesus tells us that take joy, right? I have overcome the world, which means Christ, he, over, he, he conquered sin, which is what separated us from God, and he destroyed death, which means when we die, we're no longer going to be separated from God. We're going to live forever with him. It's with this hope, it's with this understanding and this belief that we have the power to always be joyful because we have a hope that never fades away. It is an eternal promise that all things are going to be for our benefit, that all things are going to work together for good, as the book of Romans talks about. We know that God has a plan and purpose in this. And as James says here in verse 3, he says, faith produces patience. And that's something that we should be excited about. That's something that should give us joy, knowing that through the testing and through the difficulty that we are growing. Guys, I hate these periods to where I have to grow and to mature because it's super uncomfortable. But the only way that we grow and we mature is that poking. And when ground begins to shift, and our walls get broken down. That's when we start moving around. We're forced to, but we don't want to. But then when we look back on it, we realize, well, if I didn't go through that heartbreak, if that person didn't hurt me and break my heart and betray me, I would have never found God. I would have never put my faith that he had a better day and a better purpose for my life. But now look, look at me now. God brought me the right person. God brought me the right people, the right opportunities the right job, whatever it may be, I learned to be, as James says, patient, waiting for God's promises to be fulfilled, waiting for the Lord to fulfill his promises to me that are good and pleasing and perfect. This testing produces trust that God is ultimately in control and that we're not in control. Guys, the hardest thing to let go is the delusion that we are in control of anything. You're not in control of anything that you think you are in control of. Just take driving to work, for example. We put so much faith that the person in front of us in the other lane isn't going to swing their wheel to the left or swing their wheel to the right and collide with us head on. We have so much faith that that person knows better, that they're not going to do that, that they're not drunk or on drugs and completely out of their mind. We have so much faith that we're going to get to our destination. But we so often lose faith in God when he's the king, when he is the Lord of all, the creator of the heavens and the earth, he's the one who made everything out of nothing. And we question if he's going to come through or not. Guys, man, so convicting. It just shows how fragile we are, but how patient God is with us. But he also wants us to exercise this patience. As it says in verse 4, but let patience have its perfect work. Patience has a work. Patience is hard. Patience isn't something that we're just naturally gifted with. It's something that we have to choose to trust. And it says that that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So what is patience? Patience, it's a refining process. It shapes and molds our character. It strengthens our faith. It deepens our faith and relationship with God. And it's through patience We're going to be complete, lacking nothing because we know God is our provider. We're no longer eager and trying to make things happen by our own control, but our trust is now in God. That's what he's saying here. And it says in verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Guys, it's so important for us to have wisdom when we're in these difficult situations. Because if we start to trust in our own understanding, and we start to trust and rely on our own perceiving the things going on around us, 
we can get really depressed. If we can start doubting in God's plan and we can find ourselves in a big depression for a long time because we decided to look at things in a, through a lens that God isn't looking through. We're looking at it through the lens of the world and the world doesn't have hope. The world is without hope, without Christ. But our perspective should be different. And if you feel like you're lacking wisdom, God, through his Holy Spirit, will willingly give you wisdom. That's a promise. That is what God will do. He will guide you. And he'll remind you, for instance, of maybe a chapter you read in, in, in Scripture, maybe in the book of Proverbs. And you'll remember, like, oh, huh, that's right. The Word of God talks about this, what I'm going through. Instead of being fearful that my job application is going to be denied, I should just leave it in God's hands. Or in worrying if this person is really the one for me, I'm just going to leave it in God's hands. Because my wisdom now comes through God's word. And my interpretation of events around me are now going through the filter of what God says. In God's ways, they are far above our own. Scripture tells us that the wisdom of the world is foolishness to God. It's foolishness. It's utter foolishness. The people that we think are so wise and so intelligent compared to God's knowledge, it's considered foolishness. And if that's true, if that's the case, then why do we have so much faithlessness and doubt that God's going to be faithful, that God's going to come through? Because the truth comes that we don't really trust in God. We don't really believe that God has a plan and purpose in all of this. And we're so tempted, we're so often led back to us being in control and trying to make things happen, thinking that our way is better, but then we always come back because our way doesn't work. And then we have to trust in God again. He's trying to save us an extra step. He's trying to save us from heartache. He is our Father. He wants what's best for us. There's no reason to worry and to be without hope. He wants us to be wise in everything that we do, and especially how we perceive our difficulties. And as James is teaching us, he wants us to exercise perseverance. He wants us to endure, even with all the thoughts of doubt and confusion, and how is God really going to get me out of this? Or how could God truly have something better planned for my life? Scripture tells us that I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for, to prosper you. Plans for hope. And God's not worried because he sees the end from the beginning. He already sees the victory. Even when we can't see the end, God sees the end because he's already there. If you know that Casting Crown song, I love it. He's already there. He's at the end of my life. He's just waiting for us to reach the end. He knows we're going to make it. He sees the victory. He sees the end when we're going to become exactly like Jesus and we're going to be made perfect through new bodies in the resurrection and in the hope to come in heaven. He sees you already perfect as if you are Jesus right now because of what Jesus did on that cross. Isn't that amazing? That even in your shame and ickiness and guilt and the stuff you did yesterday, the stuff you just did this morning, the thoughts that you had, the pornography addiction, the bitterness, the grudges that you're holding against others, that through Christ Jesus, he sees past your mistakes and looks at you just like he looks at his son, a, a sinless, perfect man. We now have his reputation. It's so undeserving. It, it can't be earned. It's not something that we can do our own. It is a gift that God freely gives us for those who put our faith in this amazing Savior. And James, he knew this. He recognized this. That's why he wants to get the message across, not to lose hope. If we can't exercise trust in the harshest moments, then how are we going to endure to the end, guys? How are we going to make it? Because I'm telling you, the, the stuff that you're struggling with right now, it isn't the end. There's going to be something else and something else and something else. The question is, where is your hope going to be when the next trial arises, when the next hardship comes? Are you going to throw everything to the side, your faith aside, and give up 
Because if you are, then your faith is dead. You might as well be just like the world because you're thinking like the world. Guys, we can't afford that to be us. Let that not be us. Let us listen to the wisdom of these verses. And if we lack anything, not just wisdom, guys, but as verse 5 says here, if we lack wisdom, let's approach God. Let's act in faith. Let's believe that God will provide us. He's the good shepherd. He will lead us beside still water. He will provide. He wants to take care of you. As a shepherd does his sheep, he loves you that much. Again, let me just read it again. Verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives it to all liberally, without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting. For all who doubt is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. You're unstable. You're going left and right, up and down. You're not steady. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from God. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. And that's convicting. I'll be honest with you, a lot of times I feel like I'm exactly what James described here, like a wave. Sometimes I'm high up, and praise the Lord, I'm on fire for Jesus. I believe in this thing so much. And then there are certain times where I'm like, man, what am I doing? <laughs> is Jesus really who he says he is? Is he really involved in my life? Do I really have faith that he's going to work everything out for good? Or, if, or am I just hopeless? Am I just believing in nothing? And so many times we go up and down. And we ask God to do one thing and then we ask God to do another. And we want God to do all these things for us. And we never consider, is that really what God wants for us? Or is that just what we think is right for us and we don't bring anything to God? We just believe that our way is what should be. But we never consult the way, Jesus Christ, in anything that we do. God's just in the back seat. We still have our hand on the wheel. And everybody knows that saying in that song, Jesus, take the wheel. Who is in control of your life? Who is directing and guiding? Who is the voice on the GPS? of your life because if it's you you do not know where you're going your best guess is off a cliff or in the river compared to god's voice but how do we hope to receive anything from god as verse 7 says we don't even know what god wants for us if you're asking god to win the lottery ticket or to get this girl or to get this or to get that then it seems to me that you just want god to be your little genie in a bottle like from aladdin that you just rub once in a while just so you can get some extra luck in getting your way. Because you truly don't want God to change your life. You just want God to help you in your own personal pursuits. But God's saying, no, those aren't my plans for you. My plans for you are good, pleasing, and perfect. They're for your benefit. They're for my glory. You're truly fulfilling the next high. The next binge, it won't satisfy you. But come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Rest for your souls, Jesus says. Come to him. Don't be double-minded. Don't be focusing on your own desires. As Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 tells us, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. All of your heart. Not some of your heart. Not just a little bit of your heart. All of your heart. And lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Guys, do not trust in every thought that comes your way, but trust in the word, trust in the Lord, and be patient for his response. Pray to him, ask him for anything in his name, he is faithful, and trust he will do it. If you're praying in a selfless heart, seeking his will, he is faithful. But as I end here, in these couple of verses, I'm just very captivated by the wisdom of James because I know from personal experience how contrary I am from what James is instructing us to live like. 
it's convicting. It hurts. It's like, ah, no, I know I'm not doing this right. <laughs> There's something lacking in my life. I need to be doing it better. That just means I need to be more in God's word. I need to be seeking his will rather than my own. I so often just want to do my own thing and go my own way and be the Lord of my life, but that might not be what God wants for me. I know it's not what God wants for me. I know it's not what God wants for you. So if any of you guys here, if you're struggling with this, I know there's, I think all of us can attest to this, that we don't count trials in difficulty and the worst situations as joy because we just think it's the end of everything. All my plans, ah, oh, it's it's in the toilet. Literally, they're gone. Now what do I do? We so often rely on our own feelings and understanding rather than God. If you're like that today and you want to be set free from that, I pray that you just raise your hand. I just want to pray for you that God would enter in this perfect peace and patience and he would do this work into you to relieve you from your own pursuits and understanding and that you would trust simply in what the word of god says that you would rip off the messiah complex the the god of your own life which is so often ourselves i pray that he would rip that away and that jesus christ would be leading your life that you would allow god not just to have your heart but to be lord to be savior that you would confess your sins to him And scripture says that he is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins and cleanse us from all wickedness, to make us right in God's sight freely by believing in what Jesus did on that cross. If you want to walk in faith, if you want to walk in perseverance, then the first step is to count it joy. Count it joy. God is going to do something with this. God is going to use this somehow in some way. Even when you think that you messed up too much and there's no way God can use this or use you. Just like we were talking about this Sunday, look at Peter. He denied Jesus. He messed up so much and yet God wanted to use him to build his church. God is so patient, so merciful, so loving. He loves you so much here today. I pray that you would give your lives to him. So yeah, guys, I pray that these teachings would meditate in your heart and please feel free to really think about what James is talking about here because this is truly wisdom that we need in our daily lives. So meditate on these sayings and I pray that you'd be encouraged and that you'd be strengthened tonight. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys, let's end with one more song to the Lord.